the things of interest that we'd find would be some of the parts of the plane embedded in the cars and in places in which you just wouldn't expect um, a part of the um, fins off the turbine or for one of the engines was actually found embedded in, into one of the engine blocks of one of the cars. But I think the most unique thing about this investigation has just been the, the unbelievable damage. The levels of heat in which, in certain instances, of firearms were found in some of the vehicles that had um, completely melted down and the temperatures that we were told were in the area of three to 4,000 degrees that they melted uh, a steel revolver down into a blob of, of metal again. These were some of the things. An engine block that was aluminum and its pistons were uh, cast iron and, and other parts of the engine were steel and the aluminum had actually melted around the steel and the iron and had dripped off like teardrops coming from the, uh, from the parts of the car. Uh, fronts of automobiles that just melted away from the extreme heat and yet the rest of the automobile was was otherwise intact and these these steel automobiles that give people such belief in in being secure and 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 well made while they're driving 70 miles an hour on a highway are found to be little piles of of tin cans after they've been struck by the immensity of this this attack to what was just an enormous piece of American history. It was this crime scene in the backyard that no one knew about. After the Trade Center collapse, it was evident that the rescue workers would not be able to recover all the human remains at the site given the complex activity at the World Trade Center. So they decided they needed an off-site location to do this. They considered two sites. Floyd Bennett Field was one Right away they decided that it would be fresh kills and they reopened 175 of the 2,200 acres. In the beginning, there were people that wanted the name of the landfill changed. They thought it was a morbid thing, but a kill, kill is Dutch for a river. And so the name was kept. Many of the objects were just from everyday life and very sort of neutral objects that couldn't be identified with a person. You'd see stuffed dolls. These were souvenirs from the gift shops. Um, an odd thing, one day we saw a cigar store Indian, a, um, a life-size carved Indian. It was very um, demolished but recognizable. We saw pieces of Rodin bronze. It was interesting, when they found the Rodin bronzes, they found a, a torso bronze with the head and feet cut off, and right away they thought they had found human remains, and it was turned out to be a bronze piece. We saw lampposts. One day we were there, and there was a, um, this enormous pile of lampposts from one of the, the surrounding streets and uh, fire hydrants that had come over. So the, the material would come over every day in a barge, depending on where they were cleaning up downtown. So they knew at Fresh Kills if this was from very deep or from some part of the Trade Center. So sometimes they could sort of expect what they were finding or what they were going to find. The smallest sort of things we would see, they'd find keys. And they saved any key that was marked the World Trade Center. Uh, and I think they saved, we probably saw about 200 or so keys. Another sort of things that we would see as elevator signs, little, little sign markers that mark floors of an elevator. They found 25 or 30 of these, which we were thrilled to see. When you think there was 99 elevators in each building and 110 floors, and they only found 25 of these little three-inch signs, it wasn't very much. We were you handle the material both ways. I mean, as an operator, it's basically the same. A bucket of one thing, a bucket of another, a blade of one thing and another. The only thing is, is that every now and then I would, uh, I would really say, you know, this is the World Trade Center I have in this bucket. I kind of like, maybe I didn't really think about it all the time, but I, it always popped back in now and then, you know. And uh, I myself had a, had a misfortunate incident happened to me. I was running a loader at Building 7, uh, shaking it out for the FBI, and I dumped out what I thought to be a, a wet rug. That's what it seemed like to me. 
and they halted the operation. And it was a, a man uh, that worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. He was uh, 62 years old. And they identified him in about 10 minutes by a hip replacement surgery. I was ashamed to say too chicken to go over to the body. They uh, told me that, that I had dumped him out. And uh, some of the other operators that were working with me that day had went up to it. And, uh, like, uh, I just didn't want to see it. I kept on working. I, I kept on doing what I was supposed to be doing. But uh, I didn't think I wanted to really see that. So the thing that was big to me, I, I tell you, was that if you look through all of this, you say to yourself, where are the filing cabinets? Where are the chairs? Where are the plants? Where are the pictures? I mean, a 110-story building, double it. Uh, you know, everybody has a little something in their little drawer, or you go in an office, everybody has a little this or that or whatever. There was nothing. If you look in these piles, there's nothing. And I say, but wh what happened to everything? Did everything disappear? Did it burn? Did it, uh, like, what happened to things? Things that, you know, just that you would imagine you would see. It's unbelievable. All you really see is, is concrete and rebar, metal. So slowly with their heads down, picking through um, the rubble or the wire or the, just the, the, the mass of material there, uh, looking for human remains. The main objective was to find DNA. That was the main mission of this whole operation of sorting through 1.8 million tons were to find the smallest piece of a human to identify uh, for a family. That was the main point. And so we would see these agents and detectives in these sorting sheds working on conveyor belts where the material would come off the fields and they would sort it. And then they would pick through this and these, they were really loud sheds. They called them sheds. They were open tents. And there would be six or eight uh, agents lined up along these conveyor belts with this, this ear-numbing sound of, uh, of the machinery going. And these, these uh, men and women would pick brown pieces off the conveyor belt. It was all one color. It was all like this brown-gray dirt. But they would see the shape of a bone or a human remain or something that, recognized, uh, that was recognizable. And they would set it aside and put it in these big white buckets. Uh, and it would go on in the beginning for 24 hours a day. The personal property, the personal object, uh, was all washed and cataloged very carefully as evidence. And uh, they've made a great effort to return these to owners. Many of these were from people who were evacuated, but many of them were from uh, people who died. The credit cards were very important because they didn't find uh, remains of roughly half the people. So some people just got a credit card. Um, and were very appreciative. They would come up, families would come up and tour around, and they would give them these sorts of things. So you'd see. I remember seeing a frequent flyer card with a young woman's name on it, and she had died, and that was a big deal. Uh, uh, so th those are the sort of things that stand out the most. We went into one area, which was the Building 6 sorting area, which is where U.S. Customs and Secret Service and, and um, some of the more sensitive areas were. Well, they found a lot of human remains from the towers, but there was also um, a lot of law, law enforcement guns and vests and rifles and those sort of things, and they would sort of lay that all out in the field. Then the next time we were there, it was all gone.